Today is a day reflection. In this window God has given to us in 2020, the last uh, since March or January, this virus, the deaths of thousands of people, the sickness of multiple thousands of people, uh, families divided, families hurt, individuals hurt, uh, the suicide rate is higher, uh, counseling rate is higher, a, a depression, drugs that people are taking to help them deal with things before they didn't need to take. Uh, people are wondering, can I pay for my bills? Uh, here at our church, we have a we give out food once a week. A box weighs about 30, 35 pounds of different kinds of food, and you see some of the some of them drive through in nice looking, uh, expensive cars. And I'm always focused on this one that's a beautiful black car, and, and it's not a Cadillac thing, but it's a nice car. And I and I knew the girl from the past, and I said. Uh, it, may I ask, why are you getting food? She said, the reason we're getting food is because food is the one thing we can't do without. And we both were laid off at our jobs. We still have bills. This nice car that I drive, I was paying for this out of my income, and I don't have income anymore. Uh, we are at the prime of losing our home, and all of a sudden we're going, away. these people had a beautiful car, beautiful home, beautiful children, everything else, but they're having stress. And so, folks, t today is a time of reflection. Today we're going to re re reflect on our past, our present, and our future. Where are we going? Man, for 27 weeks we've recorded and streamed sermons. And uh, if I had to tell you, like the, the, the lady that is running for, uh, to be a Supreme Court judge, if I had to tell you what I preached three weeks ago, I probably couldn't tell you. But she could tell you everything she wrote and everything she helped defend. Boy, she's got a mind. But I do know this. My future is determined by me and the one who created me. And so the sermon today is basically truths that can quiet my heart. No matter what's going on around us, you and I can have a quiet heart. And that quiet heart is going to help us as Christians to be stronger, to be healthier, to be able to handle things differently. But it's also going to help other people. Occasionally, I'll have someone said, you seem to be handling things all right. How are you doing? You seem to be doing okay. Because, you know, your average person's mindset of a minister is that he lives from one meal to another and, and uh, he, he eats chicken every Sunday and everything like that. And we need to understand, the Bible says a minister's worth is higher. So, no, I don't live because uh, from chicken to chicken, we do are wise. We're not wealthy, but we are wise. We learn to save. So you and I need to, today to look at this. God's truth is this. It quiets my heart. In John chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, this is Jesus speaking here. He says, do not let your hearts be half-minded. No, don't let your hearts be troubled. The trouble doesn't start up here. The trouble starts here. He says, trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there, T-H-E-R-E, -E, there. He's going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am going. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Why? Because he's been reminded that he's going to be leaving. He's been reminded he's going to die. He's reminding his followers. But you know, for some reason, we forget. Even though we've heard it multiple times, we forget because we didn't want to see Jesus die. We didn't want to lose him. And we wanted him to establish the kingdom here on earth because he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. He, for some reason, they thought he's going to die. And he's going to come back and here for a place. That place is called heaven, folks. And Thomas said to him, we call him old doubting Thomas, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we, W-E, know the way? How can I know the way? Well, if you listened, you'd know the way. If you read the Bible and remembered, you would know the way. See, there's two kinds of Bible readers. There's those who just read for their own conscience. There's those who read and that changes their life. There's those who read and they have to read often because they forget. And you and I need to understand, please don't forget the way. So Thomas, you know the way. And then Jesus says to Thomas, I am the way 
And I am the truth. Big statements here. And I am the life. So you're looking at way, truth, life. Then he says this. No one, that includes you, that includes me, that includes the president, that includes the princesses, that includes kings. No one. That's interesting. Can go there except through me. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He says, if you really knew me, you would know my father as well. From now on, you do not know him, and you have seen him. So you and I need to understand. Don't let our hearts be troubled. And our outline this morning for the message, and again, if you would like one, text us, let us know these things, email us, and we'll be glad to, to, to send you an email, a, a uh, outline. Someday we'll figure out how to do this, uh, to send it to you before uh, the sermon starts so that you can have it right there each week. So we have good news, we have bad news. As I look out this window that God has put before me at this time in my journey towards heaven, this window that it's infected, it, it, it uh, provides a way for me to see what's out there. And sometimes I need to be able to look to the side. I need to look to the up and down, but most of all, what's in front of me. You know, folks, nothing's really changed we have how we handle the things that God's doing. And that's what I've tried to do for 26, 27 weeks. How am I handling the things that God has allowed me to go through? Do you hear that? Allowing me to go through. For Christians, our pilgrims, pilgrimage is, is filled with dreams, frightening experiences, and disappointing realities. In spite of our hopes, it is. Our pilgrimage from birth to death to heaven is filled with dreams, frightened experiences, disappointing realities, in spite of our hopes. The longer we travel on our pilgrimage from birth to eternity, the more we realize that this is not my home, heaven is. So to quiet our hearts, we must, number one, believe in God. It says that in verse one. Believe in God. And it's very simple. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me, in my Father's house. So he says, basically, trust, believe in me. Now, how am I supposed to believe to him? Well, he has given me a personal faith to be able to have a personal God that brings me personal strength. Let me say that again. I have a personal faith in a personal God that brings me personal strength. He's the only one who can deliver troubled hearts. As I look outside this window of my life, he is the only one who can take me and help me be what he wants me to be. But I've got to do my part with those troubled hearts. Nobody can take it except me. So he's the only one who can deliver troubled hearts. Thoughts that trouble the heart. Ready for this? Three thoughts that trouble the hearts. Number one, thoughts regarding death. How do we get? It's there. Trouble, troubled times, it's there. This virus, it's there. And you and I need to understand, there's thoughts that trouble our hearts. And number one is regarding death. Number two is thoughts regarding trials that we're going through. If you're having to do without, you could say that's a trial. We're getting ready to have an election here in a couple of weeks. And you know what? We're going through trials. We're either sick and tired of being sick and tired or we're ready for this to get over with or we're upset at everybody. And you know, there's trials. Someone recently said, Preacher, you know what's wrong with our government and what's wrong with our politics? It's the church. Well, threw cold water in my face. Because he was wanting to compare our congregation, your congregation, to the congregations he's either been in or the congregations he's watching on TV that are preaching about it. But you know what, folks? If I have to tell you that you're either this or that or this party and this is what you ought to do, well, you might as well do away with your wisdom and your abilities. You're supposed to listen to me, but why not listen to me talk like we're talking and then weigh that against what party I vote for? Then the third troubled heart is this. First, regarding death. Second, regarding trials. Third, regarding disloyalties. Our hope must be in a belief in God. If I put my hope in anything except God, my hope becomes disloyal to and people will be disloyal to you. People will tell you this and lie to you. They tell you, oh, yeah, it's going to be this. I went to a place to get a sandwich, 
And I saw the advertisement, and I said, they're, they're two for four, right? Yes, they are, but you can only choose from number two, number six, and number eight. I went, all I want is a breakfast thing, and I thought that was included. No, 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 the, the biscuits you have, you have to have chicken with. I'm sitting there going, do I say, why did I get lied to by looking, or you made it possible I couldn't really understand it on TV? Then when I looked at the sign, I couldn't understand it anymore. So folks, were they disloyal to me? No, I chose to go there. Will I go back? Probably not, because I wanted two for four of, of a, one thing, and I couldn't have it. So then it says this, believe in God. Believe in that personal faith. Believe in that personal God. Believe in that personal strength. And number two, to quiet my heart at this time in my life, I've got to believe in Jesus. So it says trust in God and trust in, in Jesus. Ready for this? It is not enough to simply believe in God. Hmm. It is not simply enough just to believe in God. You telling me to believing in God is not enough? Listen. Listen. What am I going to believe about God? Well, number one, through verse one, it says, Believe in Jesus is the one sent from God. Are you believing that Jesus Christ came and died just for you, just for me? He didn't come to set up a kingdom. He didn't come to open a savings account. He came to die for you and me and our sins. Number two, we need to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, the light of the world, the bread of life. He says that in the scriptures. He's come for thee. So it's not enough to simply believe in God. We must believe in the Savior that he sent to die for us. That he is the Messiah. He's the light of the world. He's the bread of life. The third thing we've got to believe at when we believe in Jesus is believe in Jesus is God's answer for sin. Acts 2.38 it says, repent and be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit into Jesus Christ. You die, you rise to walk in the of life. Folks, you and I need to understand. He gives us things in order for a reason. So believe in Jesus is God's answer for sin. Jesus is the only answer. We don't have to worship Old Testament. We don't have to sacrifice doves. We don't have to sacrifice lambs. We don't have to spend a lot of money on sacrifices uh, and go wait in line and go and have them cut, the, cut it and let it bleed so we can be forgiven. We just ask God. Sometimes I wonder if maybe God made it too easy to be forgiven. At the Old Testament, they showed up in Jerusalem or wherever they were going to, to give their money, to give their sacrifices, and they waited and they walked. Today, it's right in front of us. Maybe it's our fault for making it too easy. But God wants you to understand it. So believe in Jesus is God's answer for sin. Number four, believe in Jesus as the one who gives us victory over death. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. Those verses basically say this. Death is passing from one room to the glory room. I have someone that means a lot to me as a mentor, as someone that I've been watching now in my life since I was in my early 30s, and uh, the person's had a stroke, and they're expecting him to die. And I was talking to him just the day or the evening before he had the stroke, and he was having some issues. And all of a sudden, I just said this, isn't it nice? that you have victory over death. You have been in control all your life and what you've done. You've been very successful with what you've done. But all that matters when you take your last breath is that you're going to have victory over death if you've taken Christ as your Savior. And you don't have to be on death's bed and say, Oh, I hope I'm going to be there. I hope. Folks, you can know. The Bible says that. So I'm going to pass from one room to the other. And some Bible translation says you're going from one tent, you're a tent, you're a tabernacle, to the place that God has prepared for us. Then number three, we've got to believe in that place, verses two and three. First, I've got to believe it uh, that in God. Second, I've got to believe in Jesus. And third, I've got to believe in that place. Believe in God, believe in Christ, believe in that place. While preparing a place for us, you and I, and I wish I'm, I'm acting like I'm talking to you right here as, I'm, as we're recording this. And I can see people that I wish would believe this. While preparing a place for us, Christ is preparing us for that place. He's going to prepare a place. I mean, Jesus was a carpenter, taught by a carpenter. His, his earthly father was uh, a carpenter. So he's been there 2,000, over 2,000 years preparing a place for you and for me. 
Now remember, the Bible's real clear. He's preparing a place. You've already prepared the place if you're going to get that place. So then it says, We are being prepared in the presence of God today for the presence for eternity in heaven for eternity. So he says that he's preparing that place for me. As God prepares us for heaven, he gives us certain tools to use in our preparation. Number one is trials. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through 4, trials. Do you have any trials? Good, you're being prepared. Troubles. Ephesians 2.10, do you have any troubles? Good. That means you're being prepared. Uh, he's preparing me and using me through pressure. So trials, trouble, and pressures. Philippians 2.13 and James 1, 2 through 4 tells us, do you have any of those? God's preparation tools are for our appointment in heaven. If we are not being prepared, heaven's not going to be a place that I thought it was going to be. And you and I need to understand, that's a special place. So in closing, he says, believe in God, believe in me, and believe in that place we called heaven. Revelation chapter 21 and 22 gives the most detailed description of heaven in the Bible. It says three things in chapter 1 and chapter, 20, chapter 21 and 22 of Revelation. There'll be streets of gold. There'll be gates of pearl. There'll be walls of jasper. Heaven is going to be, ready for this? Heaven's going to be an awesome place. Because we've never seen or behold anything like he's preparing for those of us. Remember, we're child of a king. We're adopted because the blood of Christ was shed so that we're part of that family. And we will inherit the things that he's preparing for those that he loves. Heaven will be a place where there's no tears. Where there's no death where there's no mourning or sorrow, where there's no crying, where there's no more pain. Everything will be bright, will be new, will be refreshing, and they'll even be pure, even you. New heart, new body. Nah, I'm just going to get a body that God's preparing for me because my heart's new today when I accept Christ. The most exciting thing about heaven is this. You and I won't be there alone. God will be there. There was a lady years ago attended our congregation in, here in Brownsville. She said, I'd like to have some coffee with you at the donut shop so I can ask some questions to you. I'd like for that to be my church home, but I just don't know if you would accept me. I said, well, let's go talk. I mean, all kinds of things run through my mind. She said, here's my question. I see what the Bible says, but I cannot consume in my mind what heaven is like. That place he's building for me, with what money we've had, we've, we have a nice home, we live in a nice community, we drive comfortable cars, we're, our, our retirement is, 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 is comfortable, but I'm having trouble. Do I have to believe what this book says about heaven? And I said, you know, I've never heard that. And you're asking me to explain it, right? Yeah. I said, I got the answer for you. She says, that's right, I called you. I said, I've got this much education. I've got this much experience. I've taught on heaven. I've preached on heaven. I've read books on heaven. I've listened to other people talk about heaven. Do I have the answer for you? Ready for this? I don't really know. All of those things that I've accumulated in my physical look nice. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Maybe there's been pictures of maybe what some of this might be. But folks, we will not know until we go to heaven and we, in all his glory, see those things the way he wants us to see them in our new body. We'll not be living in this sinful body. We'll not be living with the things we've thought about our whole life. We will be new. We will be clothed in God. And we will see things the way God wants to see us. So he says, let not your hearts be troubled. We're not saying, we're not saying goodbye. When you die, when I die, we're not saying goodbye to our family. The key thing is I'm saying, ready for this? If you're a Christian, I'll see you later. I'll see you later. When my mother was dying, 
when a friend of mine was dying, almost similar things, they began to stare into the corner of the room where they were at. And the one with my mother, there's a hospice nurse there. She said, you wonder what your mother's staring at? I got over and got next to where she was looking. I said, yeah, I, she's not, she looks like she's staring at the corner of the room. She says, she's staring at something that's getting her attention. And we've seen this for years as hospice nurses. There's something in that corner that's not scaring her. It's calling her. And so you and I need to understand, God doesn't take us to heaven. He allows us to come into heaven. How about you? Are you ready to be welcomed into heaven? Let not your hearts be troubled. You've got to put your belief in God. You've got to put your belief in Jesus. You've got to put your belief in that place. This world is not my home. One night a man had a dream. He dreamed he was walking across the beach in front of the Lord. Across the sky flashed scenes from his life. What he did. Things he'd even forgotten about. And across the skies it flashed all this about his life. For each scene he noticed two sets of footprints and everything that he saw flashed before him. And as he looked and he saw those footprints in the sand, one belonging to him and the other one belonging to the Lord. And then he said this, when the last scene of his life flashed before him, and you and I will have that, he looked back at the footprints in the sand where there were two sets of footprints. Then he noticed that many times along the path of his life, there was only one set of footprints. He also noticed that it happened at the very lowest and saddest times of his life. That really bothered him. And he questioned the Lord about it. Lord, you said you, that you would, once I, I followed you, you'd be with me always. You would walk with me always. But I noticed that during the most troublesome times in my life, there is only one set of footprints. I don't understand why in times when I needed you most, you would leave me. I'd be on my own. And the Lord said this, my precious Precious child. Well, that's personal. I love you and would never leave you. During your times of trials and suffering, when you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Maybe the Lord's carrying you today. You feel by yourself. You feel there's no other footprints. Uh, quit looking at the, the footprints that he's carrying you because that's what's happening. But here's the interesting thing. When he carries you, you're not heavy. When you walk next to him, he's there comforting you, talking to you. Sometimes he has to carry us, sometimes he has to talk to us. But he says this, let not your hearts be troubled. He's preparing a place for you, and that place is called heaven. And it is open for all of us. But you know, the Lord has chosen those who have accepted him as Lord and Savior and who live for him. Faith comes through hearing the word of God. Some people will hear this message streamed to wherever it goes. And they'll say, I never heard that in the Bible. I never read that in the Bible. Well, today you have. Today you've got to do something about it. So it's for me and my household. We will follow John 14. Believe in God, believe in Christ, and believe in that place called heaven. As we close our message, I must ask you this. You want to go to that place. To do that, you've got to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. Simply by saying, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then you say, I take him as my Lord and Savior. Because you know you're a sinner and without God, you're doomed to hell. Think about it. And I believe there's a hell and I believe the devil's sitting there welcoming you into hell as fast as you can get there. And he's not carrying you. You've got to go there yourself. Your choice. So today, if you're not a Christian, why not? Well, I've got all kinds of reasons. No, that's just what it is. It's just excuses. Today, you can accept the one who's preparing a place for you, and that place is awesome because God is going to be there and Jesus is going to be there. And those who are believers in Christ are going to be there. And you, I, you know, I hope I, I'm interrupted while I'm in heaven and someone comes up to me and says, John, you don't remember me because when I met you, I was about 10 years old at church camp. And you were teaching a class about Jesus and you said something like this. If you're not a Christian, why not? 
Well, even at 10, 11 years old, I had to think about that. I just thought automatically I was because we went to church. I just thought automatically we were because my mom and my daddy, my grandma, my grandpa, my great, all these goes all the way back to the beginning were Christians. But I never accepted him personally. He said at church camp where I heard the word of God, I did something I'd never done before. When I got home at church on Sunday, instead of going into children's church, I went into the big church. And they offered what's called an invitation would you like to accept Christ today? Would you like to make his good confession? Would you like to be baptized into him for the forgiveness of your sins? This young man at the invitation time, just as I am, without one plea, he stepped up, he walked to the aisle, and he walked down that aisle. His parents didn't even know he was going to do it. The preacher looks back at him, and, they, and he got up to him, and the, and the preacher says to little Johnny, what do you want? He said, I want to accept Christ as my Savior. That day he made that confession and before the service was dismissed he was baptized into Christ rising to walk in newness of life with the promise of that place. How about you? Let's pray. Father bless us. Bless the message. There's no other place like heaven. Money can't buy it. Only our faith in you and following you and having you in our hearts and leaving the Holy Spirit there so that it can guide us and direct us. Lord, lay some soul upon our hearts and touch that soul through us. In Jesus' name we pray. We pray in the name of Jesus, the one that's the name above all names. Only through Jesus can we be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.